speaker. So it's my privilege to introduce two, two speakers. The first speaker that we have is Dr. Clay White. He is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and director of skeletal and health dysplasia program at Seattle Children's Hospital. He's a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Washington and a diplomat of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. But I wanted to also share with you guys that he's an internationally recognized expert and advocate in the care of MPS and skeletal dysplasia and serves on the Medical Advisory Board of the Little People of America and an executive founding member of the Skeletal Dysplasia Management Consortium. So let's welcome Dr. Clay White. Thanks, Terry. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about orthopedics. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important, and, and strangely enough for this conference, I didn't put this in my bio. Um, and so if, if, if you don't know this, I had a daughter, um, her name was Susanna, and she had MPS1. She was born in 1999 and had a bone marrow transplant at the University of Minnesota. She ended up dying nine years later due to some other complications, but uh, Nonetheless, uh, having this little girl into my life brings me to you and you to me and brings us all into this together. So coming to this conference is, is very important and special to me. So <clears throat> I'm gonna talk now a little bit about orthopedics. And I, I tried to change this talk around a little bit because A, it was getting stale, but B, um, I, th I think there's, a, there's sometimes a little bit of a fundamental misunderstanding of what we do in orthopedics. And well, it, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Um, the, the term is a little bit redundant because orthopedics just means straightened children. Um, it, what we do is, is we prevent and treat musculoskeletal disorders of children, and if you're an adult orthopedic surgeon, then adults. But we're not just a, um, <clears throat> so we're not just surgeons. We are really the only, you know, full-time caretakers for, for deformity and, and, uh, and joint pain for the most part. You know, rheumatologists do inflammatory disease and endocrinologists take care of your bone, general bone health. But uh, there's no one who else is really focused on the bones like we are. And so it's surgical care and non-surgical care. And for me, that's specific to children. So what we're going to be talking about today, and I'll, I'll get into this, and then Linda's going to talk to, talk to you about it in a slightly different, from a different perspective, um, is dysostosis multiplex. And this is the term that has been specifically applied to skeletal findings in MPS. And it's true in all forms of MPS. Even our children and our, our, our loved ones who have San Filippo have bone changes that, you, that become, that are evident on x-ray. And so this is, this is a combination of two things. One is it's, it's the biology, it's the genetics and the way that the, the, the um, molecules interact with each other as the bone grows, but it's also over the long term an inflammatory disease. And again, Linda will talk to you a little bit more about that. It starts with deformity in early life and later in life ends up with joint disease or arthrosis, arthritis of the, of the, of the joints. And there are some other issues we'll talk about such as carpal tunnel syndrome. And we, when we look at a, a, an individual from an orthopedic standpoint, when we, first of all, when we're talking about deformity, we'll look at you from the front, what we call a coronal plane. So in terms of the extremities, we're talking about varus and valgus. And so valgus is when the, when the joints come together, varus is when they go apart. And I was taught as a medical student that on, on the eighth day, God looked down, looked at the world and said, thou shalt not varus. So varus is when it goes apart and it looks like a circle. Okay, and you can see the same deformities in the upper extremity, and in the spine, that coronal plane deformity is what we call scoliosis. If you look um, at rotational changes, so particularly with the legs, your, do your feet turn in? Do they turn out? And that can ca happen anywhere. It can happen up at the hips, in the anywhere in the femur, below the knees, and the feet. And so we have to be very thorough about the way we look at rotation. And then finally, sagittal plane, which is looking at you from the side. And in the lower extremities, we talk about ray curvatum and pro curvatum. So pro curvatum is coming forward, ray curvatum is going back. And so if you're stiff and you have contractures, then you're gonna have pro curvatum. And if you're lax and you have hyperextension of your knees, that's ray curvatum. And that can be within the joints or it can be within the bones. And then we talk about joint disease. Now, joint disease is really, um, you know, it, it, it ultimately it, it's an inflammatory disorder. Uh, and again, that can be primarily within the cartilage itself or it can be from the lining of the joints, which we call synovium, and that synovium become inflamed and then let off markers, which then secondarily degenerates the cartilage. And the cartilage is necessary because that's the smooth surface 
that allows our joints to move easily. And then if you have very lax joints, such as in this picture, then you know, that, can oft that can cause other types of problems in terms of just joint stability. So with that in mind, when you see an orthopedic surgeon, not ask what your surgeon can do to your child, but what they can do for your child, okay? And this is a really important concept as we go through this talk. Because I can make your child different, but the goal is to make your child, or if you happen to have EMPS yourself, uh, make you better, okay? Not different. And so these are the questions you have to ask. Will it improve my function? Will it decrease my pain? Will it increase my quality of life? And for a lot of things that we do, those answers aren't always evident. Um, and so maybe the benefit of doing a surgical procedure or, or an intervention isn't always worth it. So, and this, this, the, the, the picture here just shows different ways we can measure quality of life and so forth. There are many ways. And what are the, so what are the alternatives to surgery? Well, we all lose, could use a little weight loss, okay, and that helps our bones and joints. Um, assistive devices, a cane, a walker, a motorized scooter. Sometimes, um, even for um, older children, it just makes more sense. They're more independent if they have a motorized scooter rather than pushing them and pushing them and pushing them to walk when it's not really in their best interest. Um, orthotics, sometimes we can, we can accentuate their ability to walk um, with braces or shoe inserts. And then finally, if, it's, if pain is the issue, pain relieving medications. So when these fail, then we talk about surgery, okay? Um, so pain and deformity that limits everyday activities, pain with rest, pain at night, um, stiffness, that, but stiffness has to be able to be made better. Sometimes we operate on stiffness and it really doesn't get that much better and, uh, or we can't make it better at all. Um, or if we just know that things are gonna go south so predictably that it makes sense to intervene early. So memorize this quickly. This is everything that you can find in orthopedics and MPS, okay? And okay, take your pictures and I'm moving on, okay? <laughs> I can make this available to you. This is well published. Um, so now talking about just different parts of the body, I'll, I'll start from the head and work my way down. So one thing, the, I think the, the component of, of musculoskeletal care that people worry about the most, and rightly so, is spinal cord compression at the neck. And this is due to multiple reasons. It can be because we have instability, so the bones of the spine move on each other too much. Sometimes it's just because of narrowing, and that narrowing can be because the bones aren't big enough, and so you have a small canal for the spinal cord. Because even if the bones are underdeveloped, the spinal cord will still develop to the same size. And so you have less room, and when the spinal cord gets pinched, that's not a good thing. And then sometimes we actually have thickening of the ligaments or the, the lining to the spinal cord, which we call the dura. Um, and I'll show you some uh, examples of that. And, and so the, all of these things combined, we have both dynamic and static reasons for our spinal canal to be narrowed. And when you have a narrowed canal, you get what's called spinal cord compression, and that can lead to significant problems. So this is just a, a these are a, a CT scan on your left and an MRI on your right of a child who had MPS six. He was two and a half years old, was walking with his mother, slipped and fell backwards, and was a, was basically paralyzed for the short term. And what you see is on this CT scan. So CT is really good for looking at bones. MRI is really good for looking at soft tissue. So when you're wondering which one you should get, it depends on what you're trying to look at. Um, but you can see that there is some the space here, and I have some little arrows which show you. Um, that, that first set of bones on the top is sitting forward on the second set of bones, narrowing the canal there. And then if you look at the arrow on the MRI on the right, you can see a small blush of fluid, and that's, where, that's a bruise of the spinal cord. Okay? Fortunately, this child mostly recovered, and we were able to stabilize him with surgery. But this is what we want to try to avoid. So there's different forms, of, as I said, of, of narrowing. So you can have thickening of the dura, that's the lining to the spinal canal. And we see this at, at not just one level, as I just showed in the last child, but you can see it at multiple levels, particularly in what we consider the attenuated forms of MPS1. And in MPS6, it's a little bit different because you have multiple discs that bulge. Um, but this thickening is, is um, due to accumulation of the glycosaminoglycans in the dura. And so this is an example of an older woman who has MPS1. And you can see, if you, see, if you look down lower on the, on, the, on the MRI, you see the white, that's fluid, that's the spinal fluid 
you want to see spinal fluid, okay? If you don't see spinal fluid, that means there's no room around the cord. And if you look up and a little higher in the neck, all of a sudden that white disappears. There's an area in between. And that's where the canal is, is significantly narrowed. Now, this person, person doesn't have um, cord injury yet, but she's certainly at risk and probably is having some symptoms in terms of um, exercise and tolerance and so forth. So how do we know if this is gonna be a problem? We start seeing clinical signs and symptoms. So, um, so myelopathy is the term we use for spinal cord injury and, and, and the way it presents. And so this can be weakness, clumsiness, an unsteady gait, and if it's really late, then you start having, losing control of your bowel and bladder. And if once you get that far, you're pretty far down the road and probably in, in bad shape. <clears throat> People who have um, instability in their neck will have, sometimes have neck aches or headaches because their muscles are firing to try and hold their, their head stable. And so when do we operate? Well, there are really sort of three reasons to truly intervene. And if anything, anything short of these, you really have to ask why, why is there an intervention going on? Because it might not, sometimes it might be appropriate, but I would say most of the time, you, we, do, we watch and wait because the risk of spine surgery is not insignificant. So if we see signs of myelopathy, as I just mentioned, so those are neurologic changes. If on x-ray the bones are just moving so much, you know that that's a high risk for injuring the spinal cord. Or as I showed on that young boy, there is a signal change in the cord. That cord has already been injured. We don't want to injure it again because next time we might not get so lucky and recover. Moving down a little bit, um, and I'm going to skip between the neck and the upper spine uh, and the lumbar and the thoracic spine. I'm going to come back to that because that's a, I think that's a take-home point, and so I'll get to that later. But moving down into the lumbar spine, the thoracic lumbar spine, we see the gibbous. Now, this is, I mean, how many hurler families here had their child diagnosed because of this? I would say the vast majority, mine was. Um, and I happened to be an orthopedic resident at the time. I'm like, this doesn't look right. What's going on? And we got x-rays, but it still took us six months to figure out what was going on. Um, but it's, it's not always progressive. So, and the other thing about these deformities is that they're below the level of the spinal cord. So we can have a lot of tolerance. We can watch these for a really long time and they're not going to cause a problem neurologically. Now, if you leave them and, you know, and, and a child grows up to be a teenager with a significant, what we call gibbous deformity, um, that can cause back pain and cause some, later, some problems later. So we don't like to let them get too big for too long, but uh, um, you can watch them if need be, if you want them to grow or if there's other health issues that you need to accommodate. Um, bracing, you can try. It, it might slow things down, but we don't really have any evidence to that. Um, and we, what we know from the Manchester group is that if, you, if your doctor does a measurement on it and your kyphosis measures more than 45 degrees, there's a good chance it's going to get worse over time. If it's less than 45 degrees, which we actually see quite a bit, um, then you probably don't have to worry about it too much. And this is a child who, had, um, who was uh, a hurler kid <clears throat> who was relatively young. Um, but had this deformity, and I didn't do the surgery, I probably wouldn't have operated on this one, but I show this because I want you to, is it actually, this is a question of what you can do to a child rather than for them. Um, this was technically a superb surgery, probably unnecessary, but done nonetheless. Um, and what you can see is there's a fusion mass in the bones. See how the bones are all fused together in the front um, where that arrow is? And then instrumentation, the fusion in the back. So this is, this is what you want. You have a nice stable construct front and back, um, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, and, and and this should be a good outcome. Um, so that's posterior fusion, anterior fusion, and then usually we back this up with a brace because the bones are so small, the screws don't generally hold so well without a brace. This is just another example. This is a more severe example of one I took care of. Um, and you can see, so this is, again, I think the important point here, and I didn't, put, I didn't draw an arrow in here, so I can show you um, right up here, and I'll show it on the other one, and, and on, the, see on this side, it's hard for me to see from here, but right there, that's the end of the spinal cord, okay? So this deformity is well below the spinal cord, shouldn't cause any significant problems for a long time, but this curve was getting so big, it was getting up 70 plus degrees um, that we decided it probably was, it wasn't, this is where we know predictably when they get that big, they're going to do bad in the long run. So 
we'll, we'll intervene. Scoliosis, we don't see very much of an MPS, but it does happen. I have taken care of a few patients with scoliosis, and my patients have morchio. I haven't really, and this patient has morchio. I haven't seen it really in the other forms of MPS, um, except uh, I've seen it actually once in a San Filippo child. Um, but anyway, the, the issue with uh, scoliosis is that <clears throat> um, it, this is not a neurologic issue, so you don't have to worry about spinal cord injury. What you have to worry about is pulmonary compromise. So as the scoliosis, as the spine winds up, it tends to weaken our diaphragm and make it harder to breathe. <clears throat> And this is just an example of a surgery, what a surgery would look like for scoliosis. You can see that curve and on both sides, and this is a bit of a bigger surgery, um, and um, this is what the x-rays look like when we're done. So moving down to the hips. Now this is probably, the, for me, the most controversial issue in MPS, and really hip surgery is, is mostly relegated to the world of, of Hurler and Morchio. Um, and if you look, you can, I show you what, what normal hips look like on the left, and what abnormal hips look like on the right. And I'm gonna kind of go through that right x-ray with you. So what we see is what's called a break in Shenton's line. You see those lines, those lines should overlap. And what that means is that the femur has moved upward and is moving out of joint. We have a very high neck shaft angle. So this contributes to that movement outward. And we have a very shallow, small acetabulum right there. So you, have, you put the, this combination together and you get the femur moving out of socket. Um, this is a morchio patient uh, hips, and this is a little bit different. If you look at the heads of the femurs at the, you know, at the top here, um, is this working here? And so I'll show over here as well. So the, you can see that the femoral head is completely eroded. <clears throat> and so morchio hips are a very different beast than hurler hips. They both tend to dislocate, subluxate and dislocate and become painful, um, but it's, I would say that the outcomes uh, for morchio are probably uh, less predictable and it are more likely to end up with arthritis needing hip replacement. And <clears throat> so when do we operate? Well, uh, you know, the hips look worse, maybe you hurt. Um, um, so it's uh, expected progression of symptoms. I mean, these are not really all that um, uh, insightful, but um, this is the surgery you would do. You, you basically cut the pelvis above and deepen the socket, and then you cut the femurs below and, and point them towards the socket. So this uh, is a good way to get them stabilized. Um, now, what, the, the reason I said this is controversial is because if you look at the data, and this is data out of the University of Minnesota, and they had um, a large cohort of hurler children who had hip surgery. And if you look in the long run, um, and this is about 15-year follow-up, um, out of the 102 hips that were operated on, five developed severe arthritis, three of whom had surgery and two who had not. So it's hard to say that the kids who had surgery were actually better off than the ones who didn't, at least from a scientific standpoint. And this holds up as well with the Irish population where you can see if you look in that yellow box, if you look under degeneration changes of the right or left hip, you see a lot of advanced, advanced degeneration. So, there's a biological component that surgery doesn't fix. And so we, do, we, do we make them, we, we do accomplish some positive things by putting the hips in socket. You may actually make a joint replacement easier later. Um, and you may buy them some time, particularly in the morchio hips, which are unstable and which are it could be because of the ligamentous laxity. And so it, it actually, you can buy them a good 10 years of, of pain without pain if you, if you operate on those hips. So I think there are some, there are some reasons to do it. We're just not really good at showing it scientifically. Knock knees, this is probably the biggest bang for your buck. It's a small surgery. You put, make an incision about that big on the knee. You put these little plates in and uh, you can get them to grow straight. So this is genu valgum, as I mentioned, that's when the knees come together. And this is the deformity we see at the knees and it's responsive to this, what we call guided growth. And so this is an x-ray. You can see the yellow lines fall outside of these at the beginning of the surgery and fall just inside the knees after surgery. And you can see the plates kind of below the yellow lines there. And that's, this is what we call guided growth. It's a tethering of the growth plate and uh, allows us to uh, very easily and with a very small surgery um, improve alignment. Now there's a lot of other ways to do it. You can put you, know, you can put these big frames on there. You can cut the bones and realign them with pl and put plates on and all kinds of things. But in the end, you know the goal is to get the hit, the, get the leg straight. And this is just some data showing that the guided growth works. We get nice improvements and 
uh, we improve mobility uh, in the kids. So um, I, I, I would highly recommend if, if uh, this surgery um, as one that I think we've shown works and probably is, is the, the safest to do. Um, moving to the hands, carpal tunnel syndrome is extremely common, particularly in Hurler syndrome, Hunter syndrome, and marital May. So one, two, and six. In, in, for some reason, in Hurler kids, they get trigger fingers as well. I haven't really seen it in the other forms of MPS. Um, it may exist, but I haven't seen it. Um, and so what happens is the, you, get, you still get accumulation of, of the glycosaminoglycans around the median nerve. And I'm gonna show you what, a picture of the median nerve next. But what, hap but what happens is that is that squeezes the nerve. So just like the spinal cord, nerves don't like to be squeezed. Um, and, what ha and, and for carpal tunnel syndrome, what that means is that for in the hand, the median nerve, which is the main nerve that goes to the wrist, that's about an 85% sensory, sensory function and about 15% motor function. So you end up with numbness, and in adults, you end up with pain in the hand. But in children, I've never seen a child with MPS complain of pain. And we, I just got another email from our neurophysiologist saying, hey, we got another one, you know, it needs a carpal tunnel release just yesterday. So it's extremely common. And so this is what the median nerve looks like and where it's squeezed, although it's, this is a slightly different pathology than what we see in MPS because there's gags around it. It's not just that carpal ligament. And so we see alterations in play, clumsiness. Sometimes the kids will, you know, the, will start gnawing at their hands. Sometimes they, don't, they do nothing and you, don't, you have no idea that it's going on. <clears throat> so for that reason, I recommend that we do yearly nerve conduction studies in children who really can't, who are certainly under age five, and then children uh, who can't tell us about their symptoms for whatever reason, um, because uh, it, it, you, you'll find it uh, often just by doing this screening. And if you see any change at all, then they should have, a nerve, they should have their carpal tunnel released. Um, occupational hand therapists can be really helpful in terms of helping you uh, find, figure out what's going on in, uh, in terms of diagnosis and then recovery. So, so a little bit about medical management. Now, Dr. Orch is going to talk to you about uh, stem cell transplant, um, so I won't get too much into it, but uh, needless to say, I think it reduces some of the orthopedic deformities. If you, you, know, if you look at untreated hurler kids versus treated hurler kids, there's definitely a difference in terms of their growth and their bones but it certainly doesn't cure the problem. And so, you know, this is sort of a classic picture out of the textbook of what a hurler child looks like untransplanted, and then you can see these kids who are out playing on their bikes, climbing, and, and quite active, and, uh, you know, at least when they're younger. So it's, it's very different. And we know that uh, hip dysplasia gets worse, even if you have a transplant. So if those box plots, as they go above zero, that means this, they're getting worse, okay, relative to um, unaffected children. Spinal cord compression, I don't want to steal Paul's thunder here too much, but we, if, you have, if you get transplanted at an earlier age or if you have more enzyme, then you have less spinal cord compression. We find similar findings with carpal tunnel syndrome. ERT, uh, improved six-minute walk test. Now, is that musculoskeletal? Maybe, maybe not. Um, reduces joint stiffness, accelerates growth, decreases fatigue, uh, but no appreciable benefit to bone. At least we don't think so. Now, Dr. Bronlin talked about, and this is another set of siblings uh, who had MPS-6. Um, who, you know, it seemed, they seemingly look different and their bones, x-rays look different. And then we have a Japanese group uh, that has tenure follow-up on some siblings. And certainly there's some reduction in, in the musculoskeletal burden. Um, but, you know, this girl on the, on the right still isn't normal. And if we're looking forward to gene therapy, well, I don't know, because this is the mouse study that shows that, well, the, mi the mice did wonderfully, their bones really were no different. So we'll see. So again, I, you have to ask yourself, is, are you improving your child's quality of life by doing surgery? So think about all, this, all the issues that I brought up at the beginning because these, the, the, the level of evidence there is four or five is not good, okay? So we like ones, twos, maybe even threes, but fours and fives, not good. And a few things about anesthesia. Um, Please make sure your child sees the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, the ENT, and everyone, and then that your anesthesiologist. They don't necessarily have to have a ton of experience with MPS, but they need to be skilled airway pediatric airway um, personnel. And I can't emphasize enough, neuromonitoring for all cases, whether they're operating on your ankles, knees, feet, hands, 
If your child is under anesthesia with MPS, they need to have spinal cord monitoring because there are now close to 20 kids I know who have been paralyzed during surgery because they're having surgery on their legs. So um, please keep that in mind. And this is my index case. It was, this was 10 years ago. I did what I thought was a beautiful hip surgery and now the child will never walk. It's totally useless surgery. So we monitor all our patients. So um, basically I appreciate your listening and uh, deformity in joint disease is, oft, is common. So, um, but I think there's still a hope for future medical therapies. And this is from this morning at the run. So first place, it's great to turn 50. <laughs> Changed my age bracket, so. Again, we'll bring Dr. White with Dr. Bronlin up after our next presenter. Dr. Linda Polgreen is a pediatric endocrinologist who received her degree in medicine from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She then completed her pediatric residency and postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric endocrinology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Polgreen leads a longitudinal study of skeletal diseases in MPS 1, 2, and 6 that help define the substantial orthopedic disease remaining despite our current therapies. Let's welcome Dr. Polgreen. All right, um, so what I'm gonna focus on are some of the um, hormone, hormones that are important for bone health. And the reason for that is twofold. One, because uh, you need good, strong bones for all that hardware that Dr. White just described to stick in your bones and stay there and to have successful surgeries. The other reason being that we do see patients with different of the MPS disorders who have deficiencies in some of these hormones. So I am conflicted as well, Liz, uh, a little bit. So a little bit research funding consulting and I do some speaking for Santa Fe. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about some hormones that are needed to keep bones as healthy as they can be and some of the research that's being done to treat MPS-related bone and joint disease. All right, so hormones 101. First of all, what are the hormones that an endocrinologist um, sees patients for, helps them with if there's deficiencies? Um, this is confusing, I think, to a lot of people, so just to very briefly talk about it, we deal with vitamin D deficiency and rickets, osteoporosis, uh, pancreas for things like diabetes, adrenal glands for cortisol and adrenal insufficiency, thyroid, and then the puberty hormones, uh, estrogen and testosterone and pubertal issues. So I will talk about a few of these areas that are relevant to MPS. First of all, growth hormone. So the way I actually got into MPS was getting referrals for patients with MPS who had short stature, weren't growing well, and the question came up about, can we treat them with growth hormone? Will it help? Will it hurt? What should we do? So first of all, to let you know a bit about growth hormone, um, growth hormone is made in the pituitary gland Oh good, that is working up there. Uh, the pituitary gland, and it goes to the liver, makes something called IGF-1. So there's both a medication of growth hormone available, as well as a medication that is the IGF-1 available to promote growth in your bones. The symptoms of growth hormone deficiency are poor growth, fatigue, and muscle weakness. In MPS, though, we think that the bones are resistant to growth hormone and that this is in part the reason why we don't see a consistent positive response to treatment with growth hormone. Um, the reason I say that is because we generally need to use very high doses of growth hormone to get any benefit at all, and sometimes even with those high doses, it does not do anything. Um, what growth hormone, um, what we have found is that it may improve growth. Uh, from data from a 10-year natural history study I've been doing, we see some improvement in some of the boys with MPS2 and some of the kids with MPS1, uh, particularly if they're growth hormone deficient. Uh, they respond much better if the growth hormone is deficient and we're just replacing what they're, they're currently missing. And growth hormone deficiency, we found in about 10 to 25% of people with Hurler and Hunter syndromes. So not just after transplant, but definitely more common after bone marrow transplant. 
All right, thyroid hormone. Another important hormone for your bones, um, and the way you know you're deficient in thyroid hormone is typically you're going to be tired all the time, have dry skin, hair loss, constipation, poor growth, and thyroid hormone comes from your thyroid gland, which is at the base of the neck here, and it's controlled again by the pituitary gland up in the middle of the brain. And I bring this up because it's important to know that anytime anybody gets radiation to the brain, they're potentially damaging that pituitary gland um, and going to cause some... Um, have an increased risk for a lot of these hormone deficiencies. Risk factors, as I mentioned, would be radiation, both to the thyroid as well as to the brain. And the thyroid will receive that radiation in anyone who receives total body radiation, such as before transplant, which is not done as much anymore. Um, also, if there's a family history of autoimmune thyroid disease or other autoimmune diseases, um, autoimmune diseases run in the family for thyroid disease. This is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves' disease. And so that would increase the risk um, for a person to have thyroid problems. And again, from that 10-year study, we found that thyroid deficiency, so mainly hypothyroidism, is present in about 10 to 25 percent of people with MPS1H, so Hurler syndrome, MPS2, and MPS6. All right, now let's talk about puberty. Um, just first, a little education on when puberty starts. I often find that uh, parents' jaws drop when I tell them the age that the earliest the earliest age that their child could normally start puberty, um, because I think most people think that it, it's got to be much later. But actually, girls can start puberty normally as early as eight years of age. And the first sign of puberty in girls is going to be breast buds. And in boys, they can start as early as nine years of age. Now, it's also important that you know the, the late end of when we expect that they should start puberty. Um, so for girls, that's 13 years, and boys, that's 14 years. And the reason I say that is because we do, particularly after bone marrow transplant, see some problems with delayed puberty. So if the testes or the ovaries have been damaged with either the chemotherapy or radiation, there can be delays in puberty. So if your child has not started puberty for a girl by 13 or a boy by 14, then it's important that they get evaluated by a pediatric endocrinologist. The other point is that a girl's first period should start typically around 12 to 13, but it's generally about two to two and a half years after the onset of puberty. And once a, a girl, an adolescent girl, starts her period, that's when we often get some referrals um, for, for patients who might have some significant physical disabilities or cognitive disabilities that really limit their ability to take care of the physical hygiene, uh, for example, related to having a menstrual cycle or having menses, um, or concerns about fertility. And so I just put that out there to let you know that I think either pediatric endocrinologists or um, the uh, pediatric uh, OB, uh, gynecologist, um, can help patients and their families with this, with a variety of different methods now, um, such as oral contraceptive pills, intrauterine devices, which have become much more safe and are actually now recommended by some adolescent medicine physicians for use of uh, controlling uh, periods, even in teenagers, and then, of course, Depo-Provera. All right, so the final area in terms of endocrine system that we'll talk about was osteoporosis. So all the hormones that I just mentioned, if you are deficient in any of these hormones, whether it's the uh, testosterone or estrogen, so testicular ovarian failure, hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, all these hormones are really important for your bones. And if you don't have those, particularly in adolescence when you're building up the most um, the strongest, the, the most bone mineral density, building up the mineralization in your bone most, you're going to increase the risk in the long run of developing osteoporosis early. So that's why I think it's important, particularly in the kids that are at risk for these deficiencies, that they're screened periodically um, to make sure they can be replaced if needed. So what is osteoporosis? I think a lot of people probably know what this is. A lot of us have grandparents who, uh, particularly grandmothers, might have osteoporosis. Um, classically, you'll see this in older individuals who are kind of bent over, like is shown in this skeletal figure over here. They have compression fractures um, of their vertebrae. Often they can develop hip fractures as well. 
And the risk factors are old age, immobility, inflammation, and hormone deficiencies, as I mentioned. Now, part, there's a few reasons why I bring this up here, and I think it's important to talk about at this meeting, and that is that individuals with MPS um, M and ML, um, I think eventually can be at risk for osteoporosis beyond just the usual risk factors um, of the old age, hormone deficiencies, because of things like immobility, um, and in MPS, we found that there is chronic inflammation that occurs as well. And so both of these things can really increase that risk of early osteoporosis and fracturing. The other reason I want to talk about this is because I get some referrals um, or emails from parents who say that their physician did a DEXA scan because they read a paper and thought they should check out the bone density in their child and they found that the bone mineral density was very low. So how we look at bone density is in kids we look at the total body and we look at the lumbar spine. And so for the total body and the lumbar spine, a normal bone mineral density is talked about in terms of a Z-score. And what a Z-score is, is that's just taking that child's bone mineral density and comparing it to otherwise healthy kids of the same age and the same sex and saying, is their bone density on average about the same as those kids? Is it lower? Is it higher? And a normal bone density is going to be between a negative 2 z-score and a positive 2 z-score. And so these are data, again, from that 10-year study we just completed. And you can see this is for MPS 1, 2, and 6, that most of them are falling between positive 2 and negative 2 but you have a fair number down here with pretty low bone mineral density z-scores. And over here for the lumbar spine, you've got the normal uh, between negative two and positive two, and again, a fair number of individuals below that. So I get emails and calls asking, well, should we treat these kids with bisphosphonates or some other medication that we use for osteoporosis? And my first question to them always is, well, has that been corrected for their height? because it's really important to understand that one of the biggest limitations of DEXA in pediatrics is that it will underestimate a child's bone mineral density if they are short. So if your child is very short, it is most likely that the DEXA is gonna say that their bones are, have low density, that they have osteoporosis if, if a correction is not done for them being short. And that's just a, an issue with the software of the DEXA that's looking at bones that are three-dimensional and they're looking at it in a two-dimensional way. Um, it's been well documented by a variety of publications. And there are ways that have been published that we now correct for that short stature. And so I want you to contrast that last one to this uh, slide where I break things out here by uh, 1H, 1A, 2, and 6. And when we correct to a correction that we can do for that short stature, now most of the individuals are falling between negative two and positive two. For all the groups, there's still a few below that negative two. Um, and if you look here, again, this looks like probably you would be concerned that the bone density was decreasing over time. But the short stature decreases over time. And that's why if you don't adjust for them being short, you're gonna think that the bone density decreases over time. But if you look at these broken down and adjusted for height, generally people are staying pretty stable, except for reasons I don't understand, because I just made these figures actually over the last few weeks. Um, in MPS2 here, it does seem that we are seeing some decrease over time, and that's something we're gonna need to look into to understand better why. And there are similar results to this in the total body, so this is just the lumbar spine. So what can you do to keep your bones healthy besides making sure you have all those hormones checked and that they're being replaced if needed? Just the basic things that we talk to patients about are making sure that you have enough calcium in your diet. I've listed the RDAs here. This is easily Googleable. Um, if you're not getting that in the diet, then a supplement such as Tums is good to take. Avoid vitamin D deficiency. So risk factors for vitamin D deficiency would be lack of exposure of the skin to sun. Um, without sunblock. So if you put sunblock on, you are um, completely taking away your skin's ability to absorb vitamin D. So you can't count time in the sun with sunblock on as time getting vitamin D. Um, having a darker skin color decreases the ability of the skin to absorb vitamin D from the sun as well as being obese.
And generally, I recommend that the vitamin D levels be between 30 and 75, and that's for a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. The other important thing is for as long as possible, avoiding immobility. So the absolute worst osteoporosis and fractures that we find in pediatrics are in kids for any reasons who are immobile. And so I know that it becomes very difficult um, for some kids to get up and walk around, and if they have fractured, it becomes scary to get up and walk around. But the, the, the muscles pulling on your bones and gravity on your bones as you walk are really the, the most important factors in, in improving your bone density. All right, so for my last few minutes here, I'm just going to touch briefly on some of the potential therapies that are being studied for bone and joint disease in MPS. First, uh, an area that I've been working on for a while now, and that's looking at the role of inflammation in bones and joints in MPS. And I'll talk about some work we've done with a TNF alpha inhibitor called Humira, which is used for juvenile idiopathic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and other inflammatory diseases. But we have been looking at whether or not this would be useful in people with MPS to both decrease um, the joint contractures, the stiffness, but also decreasing some chronic pain and the inflammation. And the reason that we thought this might work and started looking into this was based on some work done by Dr. Lila Simonera at Mount Sinai, who had found that in animal models of MPS, if you decrease TNF-alpha, you will decrease the inflammation that improves the joint, uh, decreasing inflammation improves the joint stiffness. Um, you can get some bone, decreased bone density with inflammation, so that can, can improve there. Um, it can improve pain, because TN-alpha TN -alpha is associated with pain through increasing these prostanoids and other neurotransmitters that tell your brain that you're having pain, and there's problems with tissue repair. So she had figured out that the gag that's accumulated actually activates the system in your macrophages that secretes these inflammatory cytokines, and that if you decrease that TNF-alpha, um, those animals that were not moving around very well all of a sudden get up in their cages and start running around really well. And she showed some pretty impressive videos at a, a world conference one year on that. And so after talking with her about that, we looked at the samples from kids that we had been following, um, and we found that they too had increased TNF-alpha levels and other inflammatory factors. So over here, you can see this is just the MPS1 kids, so both the kids with Hurler syndrome and attenuated MPS. And we find this, so this is IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha, both inflammatory markers. The black is the MPS1, the gray are controls, so otherwise healthy kids. And there's significantly higher levels of both of these inflammatory factors in MPS compared to controls. And then if you look at 1, 2, and 6, in a little different way here by age, you can see, so the blue are the MPS participants, the red are these otherwise healthy controls, and TNF-alpha here on the Y. So this shows that regardless of the age, the TNF-alpha levels are higher than the controls, meaning more inflammation chronically over time. And finally, from one of our publications, um, although there's not a really strong association, there is some association between TNF-alpha, which is here on the X, and both body pain and physical function. So increasing TNF-alpha, you have decreasing physical function. Increasing TNF-alpha, this is actually increasing pain. The scale just flips with the measure that we use, so a decreasing number means increased pain. So increased pain, increased TNF-alpha. And based on those data, we went on to design a small pilot study of just two participants of adalimumab, which is Humira, um, to see if we could replicate some of the findings from the animal models in terms of physical function, and then also to see if we can improve pain. And what we found is shown here. I think the, the colored boxes don't show up very well, but I'll talk you through this. So first, um, we've got, uh, again, so increasing on the pain scale means decreasing pain. So here's a participant who, um, this dotted line here are the pain measures. And while on treatment, you can see the pain uh, reported was stable from baseline to 16 weeks on the treatment. 
Once he went off the treatment, the following six weeks after he came back at week 32, reported a significant increase in the pain. And here is subject two, where we see here on placebo, so they started on placebo, they had an increasing pain, so again, decreasing means increasing pain, and then started treatment, and their pain improved again. And on the, you're right, if we look at um, the effects on the joint range of motion, so we've got shoulders, elbows, hips, and knees. The key place to look is over here for difference in treatment versus placebo. And all of these bolded ones are the degrees of improvement in all those joints um, in participant one and participant two. So basically, it generally did seem to decrease pain and improve joint range of motion in most of the joints. And based on that, we received approval from the FDA to go on and design a larger study um, of Humira um, to try to confirm these findings in a larger group. And that study is currently enrolling. Um, that study starts out with the placebo, uh, double-blind placebo control, and then everyone receives treatment. And I can share just some very preliminary results here. This is only four participants. Um, this could change. We have nine more to enroll. Um, we have enrolled five, and we need nine more. But just preliminarily, looking at this for the, this meeting, I pulled this out. And we've got the change in degrees and range of motion. And this is all, this is sh um, shoulders, elbows, hips, and knees. And in red is the treatment group, and in blue is the placebo. And so early on here, it does again look to be that there's improved range of motion in the treatment compared to the placebo. But again, that's only four participants, and so we'll have to enroll the rest and, and see how things look at the end. All right. Um, another way that we were trying to address the skeletal disease was using enzyme replacement therapy after BMT. So this was a study that Dr. Paul Orchard and I did um, during my time at Minnesota. And it was a clinical trial of loranidase in kids with Hurler syndrome two or more years after bone marrow transplant. And this study enrolled 10 participants who were, as I mentioned, two or more years after transplant. They received weekly eldurazime at your standard uh, doses of, that's used in clinical practice, and they were in the study for two years. And what we found was that, that potentially in just the two youngest participants, there did seem to be some improvement in their growth. So these two blue lines um, are the two of the treated participants, and all this gray in the back and these black lines here, that's the control group. So that was the how the kids in the natural history study had grown over those 10 years, and it does appear that these two young kids had improved growth. The older participants did not have any difference in their growth compared to historic controls. And in terms of range of motion, we really didn't see any improvement in joint range of motion over the two years on eldurazime, which is not surprising because there's a fair amount of data now, um, particularly animal data, showing that uh, it's very difficult for ERT to get into the joints. Another approach that's being used to address the joint disease in MPS would, is pentosin polysulfate. And this is being, um, these studies are being conducted by Dr. Shookman and Dr. Simonera from Mount Sinai. They completed a um, phase two uh, open label randomized uh, study of pentosin polysulfate, which is uh, Elmeron. And they did this in patients with MPS1. There were four participants who were 18 years of age or older. They dosed them with a subcutaneous injection of PPS, or pentosin polysulfate, um, weekly for 12 weeks and then biweekly for 12 weeks and at two different doses, the one milligram and the two milligram per kilogram. And this was for 24 weeks of treatment. And what they found is shown here briefly. Um, we've got here the number of joints that have in improved or not improved, and you can see here that black is that they got worse over time, gray is that they uh, only changed by negative 5 to negative 9 degrees, blue is no change, uh, yellow is 5 to 9 degrees improvement, and pink is 10 or more degrees improvement. And so at least in three, these three of the four participants, you did see at least a 10 plus improvement in some of the joints. And when we look at pain, Pain improved in individuals with the severe but not moderate pain. And it's not quite clear why this is, but you can see these two individuals who started out with very high pain scores. And now this pain score they used is flipped, so a lower number 
is decreased pain. And so these two with high pain scores did have a decrease over time in their pain, versus the two with the more moderate pain were pretty stable over the study. And then uh, intraarticular gene therapy is, has been tried just in an animal model of MPS. So this was done uh, by Dr. Ray Wang at Chalk, Children's Hospital Orange County, in collaboration with Matthew Ellenwood and others. And they studied four MPS1 dogs. They did intraarticular injections monthly and had six months of treatment. And I show here the results for the heparin sulfate, so one of the gags in the elbow, and heparin sulfate in the knee cartilage. And on the figures here, you have the, the level of the, the gag on this y-axis. And then you have a control elbow, so the elbow that wasn't treated versus the treated elbow. And you can see that in most, in three of the four elbows, the treated elbow does have a little lower gag than the untreated elbow. One, for some reason, went up. But then if you look at over here, you've got the knees. And again, this is the control knee. And with treatment, the treated knee does have lower gag in three of the four animals. So some preliminary data there that's, that's very interesting and that I think they're, they're looking at ways to how they could move that forward. So to summarize, I think it's important that you check hormones once a year. You see a pediatric endocrinologist to do this if you've been treated with bone marrow transplant and in patients with MPS too. I think checking vitamin D level by 25 hydroxy vitamin D is important if risk factors are present, as I mentioned, those being obesity, dark skin, uh, not a lot of time out in the sun without sunblock. And if you're no longer walking or have a history of BMT, and maybe in boys with MPS too, based on that preliminary data I shared, I think that they should also be evaluated for osteoporosis with a DEXA scan. And finally, if you want any more information on the clinical trials that I mentioned or any other clinical trials, of course, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. All right, and thank you.